Hmm. So I um, wanted to say it's good to be back, and I asked the 8 o'clock crowd if they missed me. Uh, they said no, so I was hoping that uh, you guys would have missed me, but I'm afraid to ask. So, um, But I really want to uh, really thank uh, Seth. Thank, I thank the church. I mean, the church is uh, always, I know, in capable hands, but uh, while I was gone, um, we were gone for a couple weeks because we took kids to CIY, and then we turned around and went on our vacation for our 20th uh, wedding anniversary. And so in the absence, there were, you know, a lot of things that happened. We lost a couple uh, dear church members uh, who went to be with the Lord, and um, so that was sad, and Seth stepped in and did what, uh, what needed to be done. Uh, ministering to folks and um, officiating funerals and so saying goodbye to uh, Bob Cop and uh, Joe Kernan this last couple weeks and um, really you know our hearts go out to family and um, just but I really do thank Seth for I don't know if he's in here if you we take off um, he's out in the hallway he's he's embarrassed um, but uh, I appreciate all that has been done. It was good to be gone. Every time we go away, you know, I like to go visit uh, another church. And uh, this last time, it was the closest I ever came to, to staying put and watching online. But I just, I couldn't do it. And so um, we ended up, uh, we went to a little church that was right down the road from our, our cabin. Um, and this is, you know, Gatlinburg area, Tennessee. And um, didn't know what we were kind of stepping into. We kind of looked at it online a little bit, but you don't really know. So it ended up being this little um, family church, you know, 40, 30, 40 folks, I think, and just a sweet, you know, little congregation. Music was really good. Um, the pastor, I just I felt kind of ashamed because he, he did everything. He played guitar and sang. He sang a couple solos with his wife, and then he got up and preached a great message. I'm thinking, you know, I I really need to learn how to do some more stuff here. But <laughs> he, uh, it was it was wonderful. But you know, when you walk into a church, anybody ever go travel somewhere and you go to church somewhere you're visiting, and and uh, you're like, okay, I don't know what I'm getting into here, and I know it's going to be different than what I'm used to, but. Um, you know, we, we walked in, and people were really friendly, and it was really nice, and, but uh, it was just like, okay, this is different. And it just makes you realize how, um, as a church body, we, we have to constantly be thinking about um, when new people are coming in, when folks are, you know, uh, visiting the church, um, are we, you know, paying attention and friendly and, and that kind of thing, but also trying not to make it weird, right? I, there was one point in the service where they said, okay, we're going to have a time of fellowship, right in the middle, like they've sung some songs and they're talking about, we're going to have some fellowship. And I'm like, what is this fellowship? What is this going to be? Are they going to, I was terrified that they were going to ask us to come up front and say something. And I don't mind getting up front and saying things, but I'm like, is that going to happen here? But it was just like the time of greeting and all that stuff. And it's just nothing like being in your, your own church. Amen? And one of the things that I really appreciated was just the fact that it was family. And, it, it, and, and I thought, you know, our church, you know, we're maybe a little different style, a little different, you know, uh, size church or whatever, but it's still family. We, we're in this together. And uh, one of the other things that, you know, as we were um, gone and, and uh, retreating was we spent a lot of time uh, just praying, and, um, and I really felt a, a new sense of affirmation of my call to this church. And it was just such a, a, a wonderful feeling to, to sense, like, God is just reaffirming, like, this is where we're supposed to be. And uh, I'm just really thrilled about that. So anyway, 
Uh, you're not getting rid of me anytime soon. I know a friend of mine told me. <laughs> I did have a, a pastor friend tell me, uh, don't be gone for two Sundays in a row because they can call a business meeting and fire you. And I said, it's good advice. It's good advice. So in these weeks, as we're um, kind of approaching um, a new series that I'm going to do in September, um, I, I decided to take the time to uh, dive into some areas of doctrine. Okay, doctrine basically just means teaching, but um, some some important issues that uh, we're facing in the church, facing in the culture. How many of you know what the term Imago Dei means? Quite a few. Okay, Imago Dei, it's, it's fairly familiar. It's a Latin term. Uh, if you're not familiar, it means the image of God. Um, the Bible is full of um, references to the, the reality of human beings were created in the image of God, in the likeness of God. He somehow, okay, we'll get into this a little bit, but he somehow um, put his fingerprint on man and on woman. And he said, this is the, the most, let me say it this way, this is the most dignity and value that I can put on any created thing higher than the angels, uh, more precious to him than any spirit, any animal, any, any body, okay? And I'm talking about planets, stars, oceans. I mean, nothing that God created, not the mountains, um, not uh, the, 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 the most beautiful sunset, nothing compares to the value and the dignity and the worth that he ascribes to human beings. That's not my opinion. It's not because I want it to be that way or because Christians want it to be that way. It's because that's what he said. He said that he loves us this much, he values us this much, he respects and honors what he made as a human being so much that he said he could have made anything, absolutely anything. He had the power to make absolutely anything beyond your imagination. And he decided that a human being would reflect him better than anything. Why do I say that? We're going to get into it in a minute. Because... As human beings right now in our culture, there's a lot of confusion um, about what it means to be human. There's a lot of disagreement. There's a lot of debate about what's appropriate, what's not appropriate, how to, whether or not you can choose what you want to be, how you want to be, whatever. And there's a reason for that. We're, we'll talk about it. But all of that confusion is systematically intended, I'm going to say it that way, absolutely systematically intended to devalue a human being. Does not add value. Does not make you feel better. Does not promote um, the, the betterment of self-esteem. It robs people of the dignity that God placed on you when he made you. And our job is to understand what God has declared about who we are. Amen? That's what we're going to do. We're going to look at um, who we are as human beings, what God has said about it, and why that's so important. One of the reasons why it's so important is because in the church in Christianity, um, there's confusion. There, there's, con there's an agreement with our culture to go along with what it seems to be politically correct and to abandon the, the greatest revelation that brings about the most significant dignity of man. 
God created us in his image. Amen? Let's stand and read God's word this morning. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 1. <clears throat> Let's start in verse 26. And it says this. It says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. And, and you'll notice there the uh, plurality there, and that's intended um, because from the very beginning, God was revealing himself as Trinity, uh, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And let them, humans, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, over the livestock, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth and every tree with seed and its fruit. You shall have them for food. Let me pause there for a second and, and just, because I'm not going to talk about this later. God is making a distinction between things that have the breath of life in it and those that don't. Plants don't have the breath of life and they're they are a very different part of creation. He said to, and to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the heavens, to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. Because at that point, animals are not eating each other. It's perfect. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And read that as perfect. And there was evening, there was morning, sixth day. And Father, we thank you for um, your word as, as you reveal how um, you made us, how you made this world. And the fact that, uh, Lord, we are made in your image is, is mind-blowing. We, we look at ourselves and we, we cannot imagine that there's, anything about you that we reveal because we, we, we know how desperate we are to be different, how lost we are without you, how, how ashamed we are of our, our actions, even our thoughts, Lord. We, we cringe to think about uh, how we behave, how we speak, secrets that we hold, that you shine your light on and, and we would cower, Lord, in, in the sense of our, our guilt. And yet, Lord, you look at us with love and, and great value, and not only that, but with arms open wide, calling and inviting and beckoning us to, to know you, to know our own value in that it could all be paid and bought and redeemed, Lord, through Jesus. And so, God, uh, I pray your Holy Spirit would take your word and um, deeply just speak to every heart, every mind, every soul here today, listening, watching, wherever. God, would you just um, reveal your great love, and your great truth for your glory, for our sake, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So as you um, take a look at the, the order of creation here, I'm not going to go through the whole thing here, but I just want you to understand, as God makes everything, makes the, the world, and he makes the water, and he makes the the land, and, and he separates all these things, and day and night, and stars, and moon, and all this stuff. And then he comes to plants, and then he comes to animals. In verse 26, okay, he makes a, a very clear distinction, which is that he is significantly um, moving into a brand new area of creation, and he is distinctly making man separate from all the other things that he has made. And he's making a distinction between animals and man. Why do I say that? Because one of the most prolific and um, destructive lies 
that is being spread in our day, that is widely believed, that is widely accepted, and in fact, in many circles, it's not even uh, talked about as a theory, it's talked about as a fact. I mean, you know where I'm going with this. Evolution, man is uh, basically descendant from apes. You're related to the animal kingdom, is what evolution teaches. And the Bible clearly reveals that we are completely separate, made uniquely in God's image, not brought out of the animal kingdom and, and given a new sense of consciousness, but uniquely created. Now, evolutionists at this point would say that I am very simple, ignorant, unscientific um, to even approach talking about something as uh, um, widely accepted as, as evolution and say that it's not true. Would you agree with that? Let me just tell you a little bit about what evolution actually, if you understand what it teaches, what is it saying? It's not just saying that humans are related to apes. It's saying that humans are related to every living thing, okay? You are related to an ant, to an elephant, to the coronavirus. You're related. You share commonality. Uh, you, came, you come from the same ancestors. And not just animals and bacteria, but you are related to your lawn, to the trees in your yard, to a mushroom. Okay? You, you share an ancestry with all those things because what evolution would teach you is that all living things come from one living thing originally. There was no life, just chemicals, and somehow in an instant, you know, lightning struck or something, and there was a single cell or some very simple form of life, and that very simple form of life is all of life now. It diversified and spread all over the globe and became shrimp and mosquitoes and humans and apes and cats and dogs and whales and everything else. Is that, that's what evolution teaches. Am I wrong about that? Am I, am I misguided on this? Because I'm pretty sure that's what it is proposing. Now, on the face of it, that is ridiculous. Would you agree? It's absolutely ridiculous. Here's a couple things that you have to understand. One is that even now, okay, um, species cannot interbreed. You'll, you'll never see a cat dog. <laughs> Won't happen, except for there is a cartoon. But there will never be a cat dog. A cat and a dog cannot have a baby, okay? Okay? Things that seem like they're similar size and shape and should be able to have babies, they can't have babies. There's a hard line in God, because God said that He made things after their own kind. And so while two different kinds of dogs can you know, be bred and then you can have a, a different dog and a different dog and you can breed these animals and we do this with cattle all the time. We, but a, cattle, a, a, a cow and a horse can't have a, a horse cow. They're both livestock, but they can't breed together. And so God made them after their own kinds. And we see this distinction, and yet evolution says that they all came from one thing. Well, if they all came from one thing, why couldn't they breed together? Why can't there be a plant man? It's bizarre. It's bizarre, I'm telling you. The, the idea that this, this is how it happened. It doesn't matter how much time you give it. It just it doesn't make sense, okay? Now, that's not even the worst part of it. Can I tell you, I know this is like maybe not what you came here for, but 
it's not just that, but the way that they're saying this happened is through mutations. Okay, now, if you understand what mutations are, mutations are mistakes. That's what a mutation is. It's a mistake in the, the code, in the information. Um, it would be similar to this. Um, take a, anybody's name, Josh, four letters, okay? And a billion years ago, uh, Josh wrote his name down. And over the course of time, uh, through typos, through misspellings, that that name became every book ever written. Okay? That's what, that's what the evolution theory through mutations is like. Although, um, I'll say it this way, there's far more information in a single cell than there is in the name Josh. Far, like, billions uh, of volumes of information in a single cell. There's a lot going on in a single cell. And, but for that to create all that diversity of life uh, that you see, it just doesn't make sense. So that's, that's what uh, um, people are hearing. They're being taught, and, and many people are believing that. And what it is, okay, just to help us to step back to what it is that God is revealing about us being made in His image and in His likeness, what it is is the idea that man is not special, he's not valuable, he's not important. And would you agree that that would seem to be a spiritual attack on man? That there's an enemy called Satan who loves to help human beings hate themselves. And he loves to throw it in God's face. And this is what's going on in our day is that um, through this process of lies and deceit, manipulation, a rejection of God's word and an acceptance of fantastically bizarre theories, um, man has lost a sense of who he is. He doesn't know who he is. You take that and just move the ball a little bit forward, and you can see where we get so confused about right and wrong, sexual morality, gender identity, and all the rest of it. it just, it's really not much of a leap from not having a sense of dignity about who you are as a human being to anything goes. And here's why. It's because in the fall, okay, and the, when we say the fall, uh, we're talking about the, um, the sinful fall of man into from perfection to um, imperfection, from glory to um, shame. That's the fall. What happened in the fall was that we had Adam and Eve, two human beings. And this is, again, <laughs> I just find this so funny in a way that uh, people who believe in evolution think that we are, are, are simple-minded because we believe all humans came from two human beings. It's much more easy to believe that all human beings came from a germ than from two actual human beings. But be that as it may, uh, two human beings who are perfect um, a dis came to a decision point. And they were tempted by this lie. The lie was that, in fact, I'm going to say it's not even necessarily a lie. It was just a temptation. But here's the temptation. Satan says, if you eat of this tree of knowledge of good and evil, you will be like God, knowing good and evil. The temptation at this point is that Eve and Adam, uh, who have been told that there's this possibility that the um, decision-making process of what is right and wrong can be theirs. They can actually take on that responsibility. They don't have to do what God wants. They can do what, whatever they want. And the role of Eve and Adam at this point 
is now being reversed. God made them male and female. He made them with particular strengths and abilities that were special and unique to them individually as male and as female. There's nothing less valuable about one than there is about the other, nothing more glorious about one than there is the other. They both had these unique roles and strengths and abilities. And and at that moment of the temptation, Eve and Adam reversed their roles. Adam, who should have been the leader and the protector, the provider, the safety net for this relationship, decided to take a passive passenger seat. Eve, who was intended to be the helper, the strength and the the companion and the comforter and the she decided to take the leader's role to make the decision. And so when that happened, sin had already crept into the human race before she took the fruit and ate it. Sin had crept in because here's what happens at that moment is that when she and he both decide that they're going to make the rules instead of follow the rules, then they've already sinned. Now, this brings in two unique problems to the human race, okay? First of all is... um, a self-esteem issue. What happens immediately after the fall? Do you remember? What, what do they do? After they've sinned, their eyes are open, how they related to each other, no problem with how they related to God, no problem with how they related to the earth. They were absolutely, completely confident and comfortable. And as soon as they fell... They introduced into the human race insecurity. And every human being, okay, and I, I say this with just a little bit of hesitancy because I, I think there may be a person or two out there who um, is so narcissistic that they really don't have any insecurities, but I, I'm just not sure about that. Every human being from then until now has some, if not a lot, of insecurities. We are constantly looking at ourselves, feeling bad about ourselves, whether it's physically, mentally, success, relationally, whatever. I don't have what they have. I'm not like them. I wish I could. If I could just get this degree, if I just had this kind of a marriage, if I could just have this kind of a body, then I would be happy, right? And everybody has these things kind of working in the back of their mind that they think, if, if I just had that thing going for me, right? If I just could have a beautifully bald head. And we... we <laughs> We tease each other about this, all kinds of stuff. I mean, when you're kids, it's not even teasing. It's just mean. Junior high, high school, I mean, it's just ugly. I remember, man, it's almost like a mental abuse. And what, what happens, and some of you think about this, Okay, you can, you can go back and think through where some of your insecurities come from. It's because that junior high boy said something to you. At that one point, you remember the moment, and that was when you started being self-conscious about that thing, whatever it is. And then you live with it. 
Now, the thing is that you just take a, just a half a step and you can understand why people struggle with gender identity and all that stuff. It's not much of a leap when you're already dealing with insecurities and self-esteem and I wish I could and if I were this way, I'd be happy and if this would change. It's not much of a leap from there to I think I was born wrong. You, you, under, you understand what I'm saying? It's all introduced in the fall because if you step back and you look at where we were, okay, we were perfect. We were in right relationship with God, with ourselves, with each other. Everything was right. When we fell, we fell out of that relationship. We know it. You know it. Every human being on the earth for all time has known somewhere deep in their heart something's not right. Something's not right with the world. Something's not right with me. And it may manifest in an ability or an achievement or a body image or something else, but it always manifests itself somehow in our lives that something's not right. And what happens in Christianity should is that we turn our perspective away from self in trying to be happy to a relationship with God. I'm not going to be fulfilled, satisfied, happy, or anything apart from Him. When I know Him, then I take some steps closer to having fulfillment. Now, here's where uh, I wish, I just wish I could say that um, as a believer, uh, as a Christian, when you come to know Jesus and you have a deep personal relationship with God, all your insecurities will disappear. Anybody have a testimony about that yet? We're all moving towards that, I hope, but I haven't known anybody who's quite gotten there yet. Um, and the reason why is very simple, is because we are still fallen creatures, still living in a fallen world, and glory in heaven with a new body and an absolute sinless nature restored in heaven is where we're going. We don't live there yet. We live in the struggle. We live with the weaknesses and the temptations and the faults. Amen? When you come to know Jesus, but here's what happens. Two things. You grow stronger. You can because your focus is more on God and less on you. That's a daily process and a battle that you have to fight. Every single day you get up, you get in your word, you spend time with the Lord, and you get your focus on Him, okay? You, it's not just religious talk. It's not just spiritual discipline that we're trying to get people into a right relationship with God and have quiet time. It is an effective way for you to be more functional in the world. Okay? You got to get your heart and your mind online with God every day. You need it. Okay? So it's not, I'm not judging. It's not self-righteousness. It's it's needed. It's necessary. It helps you. The other thing is that as you do that, you also have this wonderful process in Scripture that tells you that if you will confess your sin, that God will cleanse. That when you're out of fellowship with God, then the process is to get back into fellowship with Him through this, this process. I, I'm sorry, God, I messed up again. <laughs> but by the grace of God and the promises of Scripture and the work of Jesus on the cross, I know that every single day I can be restored into a right relationship with God. There are people in this room right now who are out of fellowship with God, feeling guilty, feeling ashamed, don't want to go to God because they think He's mad at you. And that is 
what Satan would love for you to continue. Don't, don't go to God. He, he doesn't like you right now. You ever feel that way? You ever mess up so bad you think you just lost your salvation? Nobody's wanting this. <laughs> I got one nod here. I, I have felt that way. Many times I've felt that way. God, I'm so disgusting. You cannot possibly love me. And then I remember what the Bible says, which he's drawing me back. The Holy Spirit's convicting you. When you feel that way, I'm telling you that a lost person who has no sense of, of God in their life doesn't feel that way. They're comfortable in their sin. A saved person with the Holy Spirit feels convicted. And that is the Holy Spirit drawing you back to say, God, I'm sorry, restore me. Bring me back into fellowship. Amen? Here's the next thing. Maybe the last thing. We'll see. So, I already mentioned it, but here's, here's the other part of this issue, is that Adam and Eve made a terrible mistake because they decided that they were going to decide good and evil instead of discover what God said is good and evil. As a Christian, okay, as a believer, I do not decide what is right and wrong. I don't decide it. I only discover what God has said. That's what it means to, to walk with the Lord, to be one of his people. It, it means that I'm done choosing if I'm going to do the right thing or what I think is the right thing. Now I'm simply discovering. You know what science is? You think science creates laws? Science doesn't create laws. It doesn't make the laws of physics, gravity, speed of light. It doesn't create any of that stuff. It just discovers what God has revealed, what God has done, his design. And as a believer, I'm discovering what he has said about who I am, how to live, how to relate, how to be. I'm just discovering it. And when I discover it, here's the wonderful fellowship that we can have with God. When I discover it, I'm simply going to agree. I agree. We, we had a discussion with our girls driving home here this last week, and we're talking all about, you know, um, some issues. And it was really about ministry and um, serving in ministry and who can and how and what roles and all that stuff. And I won't bore you with all the details. Um, but at one point, I said this, and, and I really mean this, and I think it's really important. It doesn't matter because we asked them, what do you think we believe about that? What do you think we think about that? And I said, it doesn't matter what I think. It matters what God thinks. What has he said? What has he revealed in his word? That's what matters. We can debate all day long about right and wrong and this and that and who should do this and how they should do whatever. And What does the Bible say? And if it says something very clearly, then that's what we agree with. And if it's not clear, then we can have some discussions about gray areas. When you come to this understanding that it's really about what God thinks, then you've now jumped into a new area in your relationship with God because now what I'm doing is I'm just trying to have a right mindset according to what he has said. Who am I? I you're going to spend the rest of your life living with yourself. You know that? You want to battle your own mind on whether you're good enough, valuable enough, feel comfortable, achieved enough, have enough money, people like you enough, or do you want to say, God, what do you think about me? And he says, I love you. I made you. I paid the highest price for you. I have a plan for you. I want you forever with me in eternity. 
he says this one thing, this one thing, please choose this one thing. You have the choice. You choose. But please choose my son. Everything is going to tip on that issue. You either receive him or you reject him. You can't be good enough to earn heaven, but you can choose Jesus who is good enough for you. Amen? And then from there, in a relationship with Jesus, I may not always feel great about myself, but I have hope. And I have a hope that I can share. Because now I'm not debating people about sexual morality, gender identity, right and wrong issue. I'm saying, I just believe the Bible. And I know this one thing. That whoever you are, whatever you're struggling with, that God does love you. But he wants you the way that he made you. Amen. You just submit that to him. He'll use it. Father, we love you. God, we praise you. You, uh, you made us. You made us higher than the angels. It's hard to believe. Lord, we're going we're gonna to be something even more glorious one day. We will be like Christ in heaven. Your word tells us that uh, we will receive new bodies. We will have a new nature. We will reflect you in ways that even now are in shadows, Lord, but in heaven, Lord, they will be fully revealed. And we thank you for that. And God, we pray that as we live, Lord, lives that are Imago Dei, we are your image, no matter what we do, who we are, Lord, we are your image. God, we pray that we would uh, receive uh, the fullness of the glory of Christ, that that image can be restored to its proper place in dignity, in in love, in joy, in the peace that comes from knowing you. God, I pray for each and every person here today, each and every person watching and listening, wherever they may be. God, I pray no one would leave, would turn away without knowing how much you care for them. And taking that life, whatever has been done, whatever mistakes have been made, and just submitting it to you for you to to pick up, to brush off, to fill with your spirit, and to take on a new journey. Wherever you want us to go, God, we want to go with you. And we pray that wherever we go, that people would see the light of Christ easily on our faces, in our words, our attitudes, however we, we relate, whatever we do, that they would know that there is something, something of worth that we have, that they can have. You've invited every single human being in the world to know their value through Jesus. We love you, Lord. We pray for your spirit to just confirm the truth of your word according to your will in each and every heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I want to invite you this morning. Um, very simple invitation. My invitation is one of two things. Whether it, you need to confirm God's love in your own life and just lay that down and say, God, I'm submitting my life to you to use how you want. Or maybe you're fully you know, established and confirmed and confident and comfortable in your walk with the Lord, but, but there's somebody in your life who is struggling, uh, who is not appreciating how much God loves them, who needs uh, the, the message that you heard today. 
and you want to just, in an act of obedience, just come and lay their life down on the altar. Pray for God to move in their life. Um, whether that's you or whether that's somebody that you love, I, I'm just going to invite you. That's what we're going to do here at the altar this morning. Let's stand and sing.